Just like anywhere else in the world, the best way of expressing yourself is through your footwear, through your clothing. And we've literally traveled the world over the course of the past two seasons. And one shoe that is consistently brought up, regardless of where we are, is the Air Max 90. Back in 1990, this was one of the most forward sneakers on the market. The technology that it exposes, the look and feel of it, the uniqueness of it. They wanted it to be something that you didn't just run in. It was a lifestyle aesthetic. It was embraced by music culture, by street culture, and it was global. The Air Max line was really kind of a definitive moment for Nike from the beginning. I think the 90 was really the first item that was successful in the United States, in England, and in Japan at the exact same time. They're selling more pairs of 90s this year than they sold in 1990. 30 years later, it is a more popular shoe than it was when it first released. They have this design contest. They're looking for people in the Nike building to design, and one person emerges, and his name is Tinker Hatfield. And he comes up with the Nike Air Max One. The Air Max One exposes an air bubble, and it was based on a building in Paris, the Pompidou building. It essentially has the guts of the building on the outside. And then Nike's like, go do it again. So uh, based on the successes of Air Max One, Tinker was really tasked with evolving the Nike running line, where he really kind of changed the way running shoes were designed was with the Air Max 90. And Tinker doubles down on the air bubble. He makes the air bubble even more present. They were a lot more aggressive, a lot brighter, um, and it introduced arguably the most important color to Nike history, which is the infrared. That fluorescent, kind of orangey, red colorway that we know again as infrared right now, was the game changer. But Air Max 90 was also popular because of that back plate. It created a license plate for the shoe. It became the coolest shoe in the world. We're in East London. It's basically down the road from where I'm from. All day, I would, I would rock that. I like these though. These are sick. Yeah, it's always, I automatically go for this shape, innit? It's just my favorite. This is a shoe that I would just say is London and represents London, full stop. Especially in London, we have our own our languages and our own, you know, slangs. Like for us, it was, yeah, boogers, you know, kicks, maxes, or, you know, creps. Just growing up, you just, People always like, what trainers you got? What trainers you getting? The Air Max 90 for me was very, very, very important. Having the latest Max. And they're a very, very cultural shoe. If you see on the front of my uh, first album, I'm wearing Air Max. Dizzy basically was representing himself, but he was representing how everyone dressed at the time. That was like the, the hood uniform. If you keep talking to people today, everyone would tell you Air Max rules the city. Sometimes there's fatigue when a silhouette is really ran into the ground and everyone collabs on it. So I think Nike kind of reserved the Air Max 90 silhouette for really special collabs. Well, in all honesty, everybody wants to do a collab with the Air Max 1. The Air Max 90 is still an acquired taste. Like Air Max 90s guys are different than Air Max 1 guys. Different swag, different walk, different type of talk. One of the first uh, collaborations to take place on the 90s is actually my favorite 90 of all time, uh, which is Dave's Quality Meat. Like it, it was the perfect story. It was probably the first conceptual sneaker store, I mean, maybe in the world, but definitely in the US. And it really kind of created its own culture because Dave is DQM. You know, his personality is, is what the store is based on. When you go down to the Blazer and the Dunk and the, the Air Force, they're very flat shoes. And I figured if we're gonna be on our feet all day, might as well have a comfortable shoe. So for me, the Air Max 90 was perfect. I get an email and they're like, hey man, if you want this shoe done, you gotta get it done, you gotta send it in by Monday so we could have it for the next season. And I was like, yeah, 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 I got the idea, I got the idea. I didn't have the idea. I'm in the supermarket and then I see the bacon. 
And then it was that aha moment. And I was like, I could make an Air Max 90 look like bacon. And I just saw it in my head. And I was like, either this is gonna be really funny or it's gonna be really whacked. And I was like, I like those odds. He also had just a very different perspective on design and aesthetic, and he was very kind of literal in execution. Sometimes it's the colorway, sometimes it's the story. For this one, it just checked every box. This is genius. If you're talking from an Air Max perspective in the UK, Dizzy Rascal, you know? He was the first one that really jumped on it. And like, you know, had the opportunity to do 90s from a collaborative perspective. One of the pioneers of the grime scene and a genuine kind of sneaker guy too. This is the tongue and cheek. This one was just beautiful. Just the, the was it, leather and I think that might be suede or whatever that mesh, I don't know where that is. The pink tongue was a touch. That was a bit like genius. It's the little things, the subtle, subtle things, you know what I mean? And then the laces have got a little reflector thing on it. When they came out, I can't remember how much they cost. I remember we only did like 200 or something of them. And I just looked on eBay, what a pair of these is going for eight grand. I was giving these away when I made them. And if I would have kept hold of them, if I would have, if I would have only known. I think it was very, very limited, super select doors. And to this day, there's not many of those sizes. And his execution is actually one of the cleanest executions of Max 90 we've ever seen. I think Atmos, in general, has been one of the most consistently premium collaborators on Nike. Atmos is a juggernaut. Every one of their collabs has done well. I've never seen an Atmos, Dunk, Air Max, whatever, sitting on the shelf. They're just, they're super unique in how they kind of put those things together. And the Duck Camo was really the most urban way of celebrating infrared. 多分, うんと僕言っちゃ失礼ですけど 多分, うんとスニーカーカルチャーって うんと東京のここら辺から始まって 原宿から始まって世界に広がってるんで 僕たちはなんかもっとスニーカーのどうでもいい商品にも光を当てて なんかこう、これかっこいいよねっていう提案型で うんと、デザインをやってる小島です うんと、小島がほとんどのデザインをやってて、ま、あの、思ってますんで、ま、あの、仕事柄、ま、あの、その街で、ま、いろんなスニーカー見たり、人々のファッション見たりして、ま、あの、東京らしさって何だろうって、